Ready? salvation oh magnify the lord magnify the lord for he is worthy to be praised oh magnify the lord for he is worthy to be praised hosanna blessed be the rock blessed be the rock of my salvation Hosanna Blessed be the rock Blessed be the rock of my Blessed be the rock magnify the Lord for God is worthy to be praised it is good to be in the house of God this morning that's not the call to worship yet I'm just getting myself warmed up good morning this is this is the day this is the day that the Lord has made that the Lord I will rejoice. 
Amen. Christ is risen. Christ is alive and God is real, real in our souls. Good morning and welcome to the St. Paul's Baptist Church where we have come to worship the God of our salvation, to honor the presence of Christ, to lift up God's name, and to declare that in our lives and in our hearts and in our minds and in our spirits, God is most assuredly real. I invite you to give your full attention to the working of God in our midst. I invite you to pray and to praise and to sing. I invite you as you are moved to dance, to wave your hand. Whether you are here in the sanctuary with us or whether you are at home online, I invite you to join us in worshiping the God who is real. Yes, God is real and real in our souls. Welcome again to the St. Paul's Baptist Church where we delight in everyone God sends. Dr. Edie Chisholm is not here. So let's take her name off the screen and let's pray together. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for the opportunity that we have to worship you. To gather some of us in body, but all of us in heart and mind, to give ourselves to you. God, we pray that you would meet us wherever we are, whenever we're watching, whether it's today or tomorrow or later in the week or somebody happens upon this year after next. We know that you are the God who meets us in time, but you are beyond time. And so we ask you, wherever people are, however people are, we ask you that you would meet us that you would meet them and let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight O oh god our rock and our redeemer we pray through jesus christ and god's people said amen Reverend Jackie will come and read Romans 6, verses 6 through 11. Are we on? <gasps> Every time it works, I get excited. Good morning, St. Paul's. Good morning, everyone who is in the virtual world. We are grateful for you being present with us this morning. Let us prepare our hearts for the scripture reading. Romans chapter 6. For if we have been united in a death like Christ, we will certainly be in the resurrection. This we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. The woman or man who has died in freedom from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die. Death no longer has dominion over him. For dying, he died once to sin. In living, he lives to God. So also should you consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God.
to have you visiting with us. St. Paul's is a church that delights in every single person that God sends to us, and that means that you are welcome here. It doesn't matter who you are, where you are, 
what you're going through, what you've been through, what you've overcome, what you're trying to overcome, you are welcome here. Now, you may already know about our pastor, Reverend Dr. Leslie Callahan, that she is a very gifted preacher and a very nationally well-known and respected pastor who is nurturing, pastoral, and caring. But you may not know that we as a community are also very nurturing, pastoral, and caring. And we treat each other like family. We treat each other like we not only fit in, but we belong here. We wrap our arms around each other. We pray together. We laugh together. We cry together. We worship together. We rejoice together. We celebrate each other's victories. And we also weep and mourn each other's losses and disappointments. So if you're looking for a place, if you don't have a church home and you're looking for a place where you can not only fit in, but also feel a sense of true belonging, then I hope that you will consider St. Paul's. We are here for you. We will care about you. And we will care for you. And we will, once again, we will wrap our arms around you and bring you into our fellowship where you will not only become a member, but will become family. May God bless each of you is my prayer. Good morning, St. Paul. It is giving time. Amen. It is a blessing to be a blessing, and one of the ways that we are a blessing is through our giving. And it is my assignment to ask us to keep that giving going. But first, I want to thank you for your, your contributions over the years, especially during this pandemic that has allowed us to continue to do, to do the work of ministry. Also, I would like to thank those who have contributed to uh, the Men's Day Assessment. Uh, or their men's day assessment we, it's, it has been helpful and we thank you so much but also i must say that we are at a thousand dollars around a thousand dollars and that's not even halfway where we hope to be but the good news is 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 that i know as a community we can get there also uh, for those that may have for those that missed the day maybe some did not even know that there was a men's day assessment fret not to yourself uh, we have left that option on the website for you to be able to go in and do that uh, even i paid for it afterwards so again uh for adults it is a hundred dollars and for non-adults it is 25 dollars. now somebody may be saying um reverend chris i don't have i don't have that kind of money you know Reverend Chris understands. Trust me, I understand. All we're doing is asking you to do the very best that you can. If everyone does, if everyone does a little, nobody has to do a lot. And I still believe that a little does become much with the master's touch. So uh, there are ways that we can give. The first way we can give is through the website. And on the website, you'll find the PayPal and the PushPay app. And um, it is in the PushPay app where you will see the drop down menu for your tithe and your offering. Be faithful to that. Uh, you will also see the um, capital campaign and the men's day assessment where you'll be able to contribute to the men's day assessment. Also, you can give through Cash App. And the Cash App address is dollar sign St. Paul's Baptist Church. That's dollar sign St. St. Paul's Baptist Church. Um, and then the last way you can give is snail mail, right in the mailbox. And the address is St. Paul's Baptist Church, 1000 Wallace Street, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 19123. Again, that's St. Paul's Baptist Church, 1000 Wallace Street, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 19123. So on behalf of our pastor, Pastor Reverend Dr. Leslie Callahan, and the men's ministry, we thank you so much for your sacrifice. We thank you so much your giving. We honor you on this morning and I say God bless and peace.
Congratulations to our member, the Reverend Dr. Jill Bradway, on becoming the interim pastor of the Silverside Church in Wilmington, Delaware. May God bless your time together as pastor and people. Beloved, it is the time of the year when we congratulate all of our graduates. If you graduated or if your loved one graduated as a part of the class of 2022, we want to recognize their accomplishment. Please contact the church office with the person's name and their program from which they graduated by June 1st. Again, contact the church office, 215-763-1502 or via email at churchoffice at 1000wallace.org. Class of 2022, we celebrate you. Woo! St. Paul's family, we regret to inform you of the passing of our longtime member, Brother Samuel Johnson, which occurred on Friday, May 20th. 2022. Funeral arrangements are as yet incomplete for Brother Johnson, but we ask that you would keep the Johnson family in your prayers. Good morning, church family. This morning, I would like to say to all of you, first of all, God bless you. For those of you who are in person, it's good to see you. And for those of you who are worshiping with us online, we're happy to see you as well. March, no, I'm sorry, May 17, 2009, marks a significant day in the life of St. Paul's Baptist Church. On that day, the members of the St. Paul's Baptist Church, after worship service, went downstairs into this elevator room right below <laughs> us, casted a vote for pastor, and elected the Reverend Dr. Leslie Dawn Callahan as the first female pastor of the St. Paul's Baptist Church. We made history. Amen. And we are giving God praise this morning. We celebrate and we thank you. Pastor Callahan, for all that you've done, we began together the fifth era of the St. Paul's Baptist Church. Number five is significant in the spiritual life. Number five represents spiritual growth. Amen. And we have grown together with Dr. Callahan as our pastor, both spiritually and in every way, and we give God praise for that. So we thank you. We give you thanks and we give God praise. Thank you. So happy anniversary, Pastor Callahan. Happy anniversary, church family, Amen. to all of you. We are journeying together as pastor and people. It would be no, would be no pastor without the people and no people without the pastor. So we are moving forward together. Amen. We're in the process of our visioning process, and we're moving forward that way, and we give God praise for that. And so to all of you, members of St. Paul's Baptist Church, I'm going to say thank you in the ways Amen. that you have supported St. Paul's Baptist Church, not only financially, but with your time, your talent, your substance, and your prayers. Keep praying. Keep praying, St. Paul's. Amen. Keep praying for us. Keep praying for our pastor. We love you. And we appreciate you. Amen. Happy anniversary, St. Paul. Happy Paul's. anniversary, St. Paul. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary, St. Paul. One of the ways we're celebrating is we're going to fun, fun day and, and fellowship together at Citizens Bank Park. Woohoo! With the Phillies. Well, which I don't is know one, about they're, they're they're awful. Huh? They are awful. They're but we're awful, fun. But we're fun. But and, we are fun. And, and we're going to bring the fun with us, and we're going to bring some winning attitude. How about that? Amen. So we're going to go on the second Sunday in June, June 12th, together 
right after church. Amen. And for all of you who want to join us, there are tickets available. I have 25 tickets available. Um, there are $20 each. And if you're not able to go, maybe you can sponsor someone to go. Um, so please come out and join us as we celebrate together as a congregation. Have fun and fellowship in one of our pastor's favorite activities, and that's cheering for the Phillies. Amen. So God bless you, St. Paul's. Contact me or the church office at 215-763-1502 if you're interested in going. Okay? Sound good? Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Here's something for you. Oh, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I took my mask back off. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I'm, I'm saying um, be distant. So. Okay. Thank you, St. Paul's. Thank you, St. Paul's. Thank you, Deacon Miller. Thank you. Something just happened there. Hold on. Something just happened there. All right, here we go. That's better. All right. Let's go to the next scene. Praise God for the opportunity that we have to hear the word of God. There we go. As it is found in the 11th chapter of the Gospel of John, this will be a very familiar text, I imagine, for most of us. Uh, we are beginning in something of the middle of the story in verse 17. I'm reading from Dr. Will Gaffney's translation. When Jesus arrived in Bethany, he found that four days Lazarus had already been in the tomb. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. So many of the Judeans had come to Mary and Martha to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she met him. However, Mary remained at the house. Martha said to Jesus, Rabbi, if you had been here, my brother would never have died. Yet even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even though they die, they will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Rabbi. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who comes into the world. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
test. Here we go. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art. This is the third installment in a sermon series called Shaky Faith. Shaky Faith. Be right back. That speaker was driving me nuts. <laughs> Shaky faith. I find myself um, returning again and again to the words of another Eliezer. The name Lazarus is believed to be the Galilean pronunciation of the very common and popular Hebrew name Eliezer. Eliezer means the Lord is my help. And I find myself returning again and again to the words of another Eliezer more contemporary, a man by the name of Eliezer Wiesel, better known as Eli Wiesel. Wiesel was made known to the larger, wider community because of his memoir, the short novel called Night. In the novel Night, Wiesel details his own experience as a little boy who was taken from his home by Nazis along with his family and placed in a concentration camp where he, like everyone in the camps, was tortured and many of his family members died. He writes in Night and ask questions that cause me to return again and again to it. He asks theological questions about how something so terrible as the Holocaust could happen to people in large part because they have been identified as the people of God. How could God allow that terrible thing to have happened to him? He talks in the book about the trial that some of those imprisoned in the camp held where God was the defendant and they were trying God and ultimately found God guilty of neglect. I go back to that story because, both because of the questions it raises and also because of the way it approaches the very sorts of questions that I am trying to deal with in this sermon series, the way it allows for the reality that faithful people not only can question, not only will question, but faithful people really must question. In one of my favorite scenes in Night, there is a character called Moshe the Beetle who is a person of faith. And one of the things that Moshe says is that humans raise themselves toward God by the questions they ask. Even though human beings are unable to grasp or understand the answers, even when God gives them. And then he says the thing that really strikes a chord in me, God help me to ask the right questions. But it is not, in spite of the fact that I just spent time talking about this wonderful book called Night, it's not Night that brings me to Eli Wiesel, to Eliezer Wiesel today. It's actually uh, a interview, an interview that I saw of him following his Nobel Peace 
prize win. Wiesel gave the rest of his life to fighting for causes of justice. He was an activist against apartheid. He believed that the human condition was deeply desperate insofar as we not only don't take care of one another, but we do harm to one another. And he won the Nobel Prize, and in an interview, the interviewer asked him had he lost his faith. Wiesel said, no, I haven't lost my faith. He said, mine is a wounded faith. Sometimes, I came to tell you this morning, uh, with already, admittedly, I don't have the answers to all of it. I don't have the answers to much of it, but I do need to acknowledge in the context of this resurrection series that sometimes our faith isn't so much shaky as it is wounded. Sometimes uh, we have our own nights. Uh, most of us will never experience the terror of a concentra concentration camp, but many of us will experience what it means to be devastated, to be disappointed, to be mortally wounded in our hearts, uh, to find that in the moment when we needed uh, something from God, it didn't show up. God didn't show up. Uh, we may never find ourselves in a group uh, congregating, putting God on trial, but the truth is, the truth of our hearts is sometimes our faith gets wounded. Sometimes uh, the loved one doesn't get healed. Sometimes the bad thing happens despite all of the things that the person did to try to keep it from happening. Sometimes uh, our faith is wounded. We believed and we prayed and we cried and we stood and we used every formula in uh, the religious book and uh, it didn't work out as we hoped and our faith is wounded. Sometimes uh, when we are in service from the Lord, Lord. And when we are journeying through this land, uh, sometimes we're not singing and we really want to see Jesus, but not on the streets of glory. Sometimes we want to see Jesus, Reverend Jackie, in the courtroom. Sometimes, God help me, we want to see Jesus on the street. Sometimes we want to see Jesus in our family. We want to see Jesus for our children. We want to see Jesus in our neighborhood. We want to see Jesus for our people. We want Jesus to show up. After all, we are God's people. After all, we are God's friends. And sometimes it doesn't work out like that. And we maybe survive the situation, but we survive with not so much shaky, but wounded faith. Uh, today's lesson uh, is in the middle of a story about faith that has been wounded. Earlier in uh, John chapter 11, we learn that another Eleazar, better known as Lazarus, whose very name I already told you means God helps. Uh, Eleazar is walking around. Lazarus is walking around with a name that speaks of help, but Lazarus is sick. Uh, Lazarus is sick uh, uh, with uh, what we are told is weakness. Uh, uh, the Greek word is asthenio, and uh, from that word asthenia is uh, a word in psychology that means weakness, broadly defined. It, it, it's when you have no energy. It's when uh, you can't uh, seem uh, to get yourself together. It's when uh, you are in steep and steady decline. Lazarus was in steep and steady decline, and they called for Jesus because Jesus was their friend. They sent word to Jesus, your friend Lazarus, the one Jesus you love, is sick. Uh, the one Jesus you love is in decline. Jesus, the one you love is 
growing worse day by day. This is the friend of Jesus. Uh, the Bible says that they sent word to Jesus about the one that he loved. And then uh, the narrator of John uh, averse and uh, confirms that Jesus really does love this family. In fact, the entire family has a relationship with Jesus. Mary will eventually be the one who anoints Jesus with oil. Martha had been Jesus' constant host. Lazarus was Jesus' buddy and friend. And when Lazarus is sick and his sisters, who are also friends of Jesus, call on Jesus, he stays where he is. I don't know about you, but anytime I read this text, I find that disturbing. Uh, that, I, I mean, it's nice that the end of the story is that Lazarus is raised. But I don't want to talk to you about the end of the story today. I want to talk to you about what happens when you're in the middle of the story. I, I want to acknowledge the pain that we feel when we are in the middle of the story. I know, and I know you know, we all believe it's going to work out right in the end. But what about the middle? What do you do when you're in the middle of the story? When you're in the middle of the growing worse and worse and weaker and weaker? When you're in the middle of the disappointment and the shakiness that comes from the trauma? When you're in the middle of living, trying to go on with wounded faith? And Jesus takes too long to get there. And in the middle of the story, we hear that Lazarus died. And indeed, uh, uh, if you had read earlier in the chapter, you would see that Jesus' disciples who are with him are also struggling with the reality both of the danger that they themselves are in and also with the death of Lazarus. But by the time they get back to Bethany, uh, verse 17 says Lazarus not only is dead, but you know how black folks say, well, he been dead. I mean, he didn't just die. He been dead. He, he been dead. He's been in the grave. He's there four days. He's been dead. When Jesus gets there, he's not only dead, but been dead. And Jesus has not even done what the neighboring friends have done, which is to show up to console. Jesus not only wasn't there when he was sick, but he didn't get there in time to go to the hospital and say goodbye while the body was still warm. Wasn't there for the funeral or the burial. Didn't come to sit shiva and be with the community of others who were mourning. By the time he gets there, four days, Lazarus, uh, uh, I love the way uh, I, I hear the emphasis in uh, Dr. Gaffney's translation, already already broken, already gone, already devastated, already traumatized. Somebody is listening to me both in the room and online who is in this case of already. There is no way to avert the trauma. It's already done. All been done, been gone been dead, been broken, been hurt, been sick, been devastated, been disappointed, already been in the tomb. And some other folks had come to console them. And what I love, I, I, I don't, I say this often to you because it's, it's a lesson that I'm trying to learn. I don't know all of what the resolution to this condition of shaky, wounded faith is. But I do know that part of what our friendship with Jesus, what our relationship, like real relationship with him, part of what it calls for is for us to speak up about it. I don't know what your it is. I have some it's. I, I have some, some things that I, I want to discuss with the Lord. I, I have some, uh, some disappointments that I need to give voice to 
with the Lord. Sometimes I've been expressing my disappointment to people who didn't do it. People who couldn't have fixed it. People who couldn't have solved it. Uh, sometimes, let's be honest, sometimes I take it out on people. Oh, come on, somebody in here knows what that's like. Or it, it, the, the person you are short with is not the one who did it. Uh, the, the person that you are, are tense and terse with uh, is not the one who did it. The one you hung up on is not the one who did it. Sometimes the issue we have is not with the people. Sometimes our issue is with Jesus. And the good news about being real friends with anybody, including Jesus, is that when you have an issue, you can speak up on it. Mary didn't even come out to me him but when Martha got there she gave him a piece of her mind and later on when Mary saw him she said the exact same thing teacher if you had been here where were you uh, that's the condition that that that's that's the occasion uh, that that happens for uh, those who are imprisoned in night. Uh, they want to know where were you and why didn't you do something about this condition? If you had been here, if you had been here, our brother would be here. If you had been here, the trauma would not have occurred. And even if it had occurred, it wouldn't have felt the way it did when we couldn't sense your presence. If you had been here, our brother would never have died. If you had been here. Some of us are swallowing our complaints. Some of us are swallowing our frustrations. Some of us are eating our own insides out for the things that we will not say to ourselves, the things we won't say to people, and in this context, most of all, the things we won't say to Jesus. I, I mean, Martha still has hope, yet even now I know. And I'll get there in just a minute. But sometimes, because we have a yet even now in the back of our mind, we won't say how we feel about if you had been here. Am I making sense? We play games with Jesus. We play games with God like if we say the wrong thing, God might not help us anymore. If we do the wrong thing, God is just looking for an excuse to curse us. And so if we get on God's wrong side, God might not actually do what God can still do. But I love the fact that Martha actually knows that Jesus loves her. And because she knows that Jesus loves her, she says the hard thing. She says the hard thing. And she says that first. And then after she says the hard thing, then she says the hopeful thing. <coughs> verse 22, yet even now. If you had been here, verse 21, verse 22 Excuse me. Yet even now. Yet even now. <coughs> yet even now I know. Yet even now I know. That's what it means to be friends with Jesus. Is that you can be dis disappointed on what has happened before. And still have, and yet even now, I know. I'm reminded of the words of that great hymn, I don't know about tomorrow. I just live from day to day. I don't borrow from life's sunshine, for its skies may turn to gray. I don't worry or the future, for I know what Jesus said. And each day he walks beside me, and he knows what is ahead. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand, but I know. 
if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But yet even now, I know. God, yet even now, I know that there's something that you can do. She speaks, first of all, from the pain of what Jesus did not do. And then she speaks aloud her hope that there might still be something. That, uh, that's a part of the story about how we live in the midst of an ongoing night. Uh, as black people in the United States of America, as women in the United States of America, as people in the United States of America who long for justice, we are living in a constant night. And there are times that faithful people feel like if you had been here, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg would not have died three months before the end of Trump's term. If you had been here, some of them other people uh, would die. If you had been here, uh, something good would happen in terms of our rights. Uh, if you had been here, uh, uh, it wouldn't seem like every time there's a bad outcome in the world, uh, black folks get it worse, uh, black women get it worse. Uh, if you had been here, but faithful people, even in the middle of that, live with hope. Wiesel says that. He says... You can't live. No way to go on if you don't have some sense of possibility. Some sense that something else could happen. What I wanted to happen didn't happen, but yet even now, there is something you might be able to do. Yet even now, whatever you ask of God, God will give you. I, I won't, I'm going to stop real soon. It seems to me that in all of these stories, I'm actually closing. Uh, I, I know you know that Lazarus rises again. That Jesus calls him forth from the tomb. That's good news. That Jesus says the words that I recite at every funeral. I am the resurrection and the life. But it seems to me that what all of these stories, the story of Thomas, who says, unless I see it myself, I won't believe. The story of Simon, who goes fishing again after the resurrection because he's lost faith in himself. And this story, even in the middle, before Lazarus is raised, what they all teach us is that in the journey of faith, the expression of the doubt and the complaint actually helps to advance our understanding of God and God's ways. That's really what I, I came to tell you. It's all right to ask your questions because God is not afraid of our questions and God uses our questions to advance us in our understanding and our knowledge of God. I'm complaining because you weren't here. I'm hopeful that now that you are here, something can happen. Jesus then says, your brother will rise. She says, I know, I know, I know that at the last day, there'll be a resurrection. I'm a good Jewish person. I, I'm a faithful person. I know uh, that by and by when the morning comes, all the saints of God will gather home. I know that part. And then Jesus says something that he never told anybody else. I am wow. the resurrection. Do you see that if Martha doesn't come out with her complaint, she never gets the revelation that Jesus is the resurrection. 
If Thomas uh, never says, I need uh, my hand in his side, I want to put my fingers in uh, his hands, uh, he never gets the revelation that Thomas is the first to get, my Lord and my God. Peter, if he doesn't go back fishing, if he doesn't have his difficulty, he never learns the thing that he learns uh, when Jesus gives him a new commission and says, feed my sheep, tend my lambs, feed my sheep. I'm saying to you that this middle part with the complaint of wounded faith with the hope that something else is possible this middle part is actually a part of strengthening us for our journey it's a part of of the revelation. The unbelief and the question is a part of revelation. The doubting is a part of faithful living. The questions are a part of faithful living. Complaints are a part of faithful living. It's an opportunity. To move forward in the middle, even with shaky and wounded faith. Elie Wiesel lives the rest of his life walking the journey of his ancestors and living in hope that the life he lived would move people more towards loving and just community. That's after seeing the absolute worst that people can do. What I'm saying it is, is that it is possible, this is the whole series, God does not need us to know everything. We just need to show up honestly. And learn to live hopefully. Right here, Reverend Jackie, in the middle of the story. Amen. This is the moment when we extend an invitation. And I want you to know that we're extending an invitation to join us on a journey. If you listened at all to the sermon, I'm not making any promises that the journey will be easy or that you'll get everything you want or that everything will work out just like you want it to. I, Christian faith is not a Ponzi scheme where you buy in and then you move up the levels and as you move up the levels you start to get more and more of the stuff you want. It doesn't work like that. But what Christian faith is is a place to journey with God even in the middle of the madness that is the world around us and that sometimes is even our lives and that that journeying I believe matters the journeying with God and in community with other people matters and so if you want to journey with God in Jesus Christ and if you want to journey if you feel led to journey with the St. Paul's Baptist Church we delight in everyone God sends we delight Wherever you are in the middle of your journey, we delight and we welcome you. If you are moved in this way, if you're in the house, I invite you to wave your hand and one of the deacons will come to you. 
If you're online, the information about how to join St. Paul's is on your screen. You can text or call me at 215-989-9616. Or you can email me at pastor at 1000wallace.org. We really want to welcome you into this community where we are learning more and more to live with ourselves and with one another by God's grace. Let's pray together. We thank you, God, for what it has meant to us to be here today. We thank you for the witness of Scripture and what it means to really be friends with Jesus, which means to tell you the truth about how we're doing. Even as I'm praying, there's somebody who's saying, God, if you'd been here, this wouldn't have happened. And if you'd been there, that wouldn't have happened. If you'd been there, the other thing wouldn't have happened. If you'd, if you'd, be, if you'd done the right thing, God, I wouldn't be dealing with this thing. I, I mean, this isn't how I thought it was going to go. I thought friendship with you meant something. Something else. Somebody is praying right now and is resonating with those words in prayer. And God, what I'm grateful for in this moment is that you are able to hear that. You're able to hear that. You're able to hear that. And you're able to use even the middle of our challenging space to show us the next thing. Sometimes, as in the text, the next thing involves taking you to tombs where things long gone are still haunting us. Sometimes, it, it, it involves hearing you say, get up, rise up. Sometimes you give us the grace of letting us lie down. We thank you. And we thank you because by your spirit, you empower us. You revive us. So that the very things that we are worried about, you give us insight and ingenuity and capacity, and you help us to figure some of this out. I'm praying that for us as a community, we need to figure some of this out. We need to figure a lot of it out. I pray that you would help us to do that. Guide us, oh gracious God. Guide us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Bella? It's time for the benediction. Hi. All right, let's make sure. Here we are. Let me move this out of the way so that you can be seen. Oh, you want to say something? Yeah. Oh, hold on. Bella has something she wants to say. After the service, down in the elevator room, we have refreshments for our anniversary. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> Happy anniversary, St. Paul's. These 13 years. These 13 years have been marvelous, and I am so grateful to God for what it means for us to be able to live in community together. Yes. I know, I see. Um, uh, our treasurer wants to remind you that if you're in the house, um, there are offering boxes. There's one next to the elevator. There's one in the back next to Trustee Jean. If you're in the house and you'd like to give your offering, live and in person. We invite you to do that. If you're in the house and you want to give your offering electronically, um, on those seats there are QR codes that will take you to the giving link 
on our website as well. So if you want to give electronically, you can do that as well. Um, it's been wonderful journeying together, and I am really grateful for this church. All right, you ready for the benediction? Yes. Sometimes all we have is wounded faith and uncertain hope. And sometimes, that's all we need. I mean, the work really is divine. And so, may the grace of our Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, the companionship and friendship of the Holy Spirit go with you today, tomorrow, and forever. Let the church say amen. Amen. Go, go in peace. peace.